This is Newsroom. Hello and welcome from Johannesburg here in South Africa. I'm Evan Hansen. This show, of course, live and broadcast from my studios here in Auckland Park. We're also streaming live on YouTube with the whole show available on demand on our YouTube channel. Now, as Women's Month comes to a close here in South Africa, we would like to focus on the issues that still face women on the continent and in the wider world. Our question today is, how do we achieve real gender equality? Now, at SABC Newsroom, that is where we'd like you to make your contribution. Our special segment today deals with women in resistance. That'll be first up. We also share the story of Omina Chinwike, a young African woman whose life suddenly changes after being banned out of a community for getting pregnant out of wedlock. Very interesting story. Then, the book, A Home for Zephni, looks at a young Cape Town girl reunited with her biological, biological family after more than 17 years. A fantastic story, that one in itself. We close the show where the crossing down to the mother city for the innovation summit that's on in Cape Town this week. But first, let's get the day's news from Anin Toma. Good morning, I'm Anin Doma. Let's take a look at the stories making headlines today. President Jacob Zuma and Chief Justice Mkhweng Mkhweng are set to meet at the union buildings this morning. The meeting was requested by the judiciary last month to discuss the relationship between government and the courts. The office of the presidency says the meeting is aimed at underscoring the rule of law as a fundamental principle of the country's constitutional order. Two policemen from the Douglasdale police station in Johannesburg have been placed on leave pending an investigation into police brutality. Earlier, the station spokesperson did, however, say that the officers had been suspended, but provincial police say the officers are on leave pending the investigation. This follows a YouTube video which has gone viral showing the officers allegedly assaulting two motorists. The matter is being investigated by IFED. The South African National Taxi Association has strongly condemned the recent incidents associated to taxi violence in Gauteng. In the last incident, one person was shot dead and two taxi drivers critically wounded. It was believed to be a suspected taxi feud at the North Taxi Rank, North Taxi Rank at least, in Johannesburg last night. In the United States, the manager for the U.S. news station from which a reporter and a cameraman was shot dead yesterday says the journalists who witnessed the shooting are struggling to come to terms with the tragedy. The news anchor who had crossed over to the reporter Alison Parker and Adam Ward was forced to continue broadcasting on the deaths of her two colleagues. Fester Falligan, who had been dismissed from his job at the same station, shot the two and died after he shot himself. In Nigeria, relatives of more than 200 schoolgirls kidnapped by Boko Haram will mark 500 days since their abductions. The landmark comes amid a worsening security crisis in the northeast where the group have stepped up deadly attacks since the inauguration of President Muhammadu Buhari. In sport, South Africa defeated New Zealand by 62 runs in the third and final one-day international played in Durban to secure a 2-1 series win. The Proteas made 283 for 7 and in their reply, the Black Caps only managed 221 runs. And South Africans are still taking to social media sites this morning to congratulate sprinting sensation Wade van Niekerk on his new national and African record. Van Niekerk won the country its first medal at the 2015 IF World Championships in Beijing. He won gold after blowing the field away in the 400 meter final to set the new record. Well, remember, you can find all of those stories on our Newsroom Facebook page. Simply search for SABC Newsroom. Of course, you can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Eben, over to you. Thank you very much, Anina. The African Union declared 2015 as the year of women's empowerment and emancipation. And although women are slowly starting to take charge of their own destinies, recent data collected from 80 different countries show that 35% of all women have been physically or sexually abused by an intimate partner or member of their community. The United Nations also reports you know, that indicates that women are still being subjected to 
human trafficking, sexual slavery, forced marriages and discrimination. At a recent session of the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva and another in Namibia, African leaders raised the issue of violence against women. Now, joining us via Skype from Limpopo this morning is the multi-agency grants initiative program manager at HIVOS, Linda Didricks. So very good morning to you, Linda. Thanks for joining us. Morning, Eben. Then also in studio here in Johannesburg, I have Nyasha Mukuan, who is a public awareness coordinator at the NISA Institute for Women's Development. Very good morning to you too. Morning, Eben. How are you? Linda, I'd like to start with you, if, if you can contextualize where we are now. Uh, if we look, take a look at ourselves first, I would think, let's take a look at ourselves first here in Africa, where deep-rooted customs and traditions still play an important part of our daily lives. What are some of the main issues that women are resisting for that matter right now? Can you hear us, uh, Linda? Unfortunately, it looks like we've lost Linda Didericks there. She's uh, on Skype Island, but you know, technology is wonderful, but also a curse sometimes. Yes, sir, if I can put that question, if I can put that question across to you. Africa, we have to look at ourselves first before we look outward. Where, where are we now with regards to uh, culture, tradition, and, and, and the role that that plays in, in the day-to-day -day lives of women uh, on the continent? And, and, and what are the issues that women are really resisting right now? Okay. Uh, thank you for having me, Eben. I'd like to say that in terms of our culture and tradition in Africa, we've taken great strides, and Africa is unique in the sense that we have a lot of cultures and ethnicities that are living well in Africa. The, what I would say that we have a problem with is not necessarily tradition that oppresses women, but it's patriarchy. That is when tradition is rewritten or written in such a way that uh, a woman is seen as lesser than a man. So that is what we strive to do at NISA, to say that tradition in our cultures should be preserved, should be uh, in, um, uh, encouraged, but patriarchy is what we are against. The patriarchy, unfortunately, is, is part of, of the way that we've put the world together, not just here on, on the continent. If that is the enemy, what are the programs or, or what is the thinking that we should be adopting going forward? Um, like I said, we shouldn't then dismiss our traditions because, like I said, Africa has got a lot of rich traditions. But it is the concept that a man is better than a woman. It is the concept that tradition was made or designed to oppress women. That was not the case. Tradition is made to uh, complement both male and females. Well, it looks like we've got Linda back. Linda, are you back with us? I'm back, thank you. Okay, fantastic. Linda, uh, did you hear the first question? We spoke about tradition, culture, and the likes here with ourselves on, on the continent. I'd like to take it forward and maybe ask you, what kind of programs are you guys uh, putting in play to, to detangle it a little bit? Well, we have various programs in the organization that I'm working for. It's called HIVA, South Africa. And we try and look at women's organizations that are mobilizing women at grassroots level because there's multiple levels that this problem needs to be addressed from. We have to look at power and where power is located, not only power in terms of state power, but power at local level in communities. So we're supporting women's groups that are trying to address issues where they are not getting access to the resources, and we fund these organizations through a grant. Then in our office in Harare, they're working with a program in Zambia that looks at child marriages, and they have successfully been lobbying and advocating for changes to the practices around child marriages. It did take a very long time for this change to take place. So those are the kinds of initiatives that mm. get supported through our organization. Linda, just tell but me. But one has to take the long-term view. Just tell us quickly, Linda, what, what do you believe right now are, are the most concerning practices affecting women here on the continent? Um, well, I'll give a few examples. There's some interesting examples that I've come across in Namibia, for example, 
There's, and this does, most of these practices work in, in favor of men and support patriarchy. There's wife swapping that takes place um, in a nomadic tribe in Namibia. And um, this contributes to risky behavior, first of all, because the HIV and AIDS levels are high, and this is just fueling it. And leadership in that country is saying that this practice is a culture that gives us unity and friendship. That's one example. In Kenya, they are drawing... Well, it looks like we've lost Linda once again, but let's come back to Chinyasa, to you here in the studio. Tell us about your experience with women affected by violence and these kinds of uh, kind of practices. What, what the most prevalent situations that you've come across? Well, I can speak for the South African context where we mm. find a lot of women are experiencing physical violence, emotional, verbal, and financial violence. You find that uh, the practice of ukutwala is really a problem, especially in our rural areas. So that's what we're trying to raise awareness about and try to change the practice so that it's not... Um, used to um, um, against the, the girl child because yeah. it's usually it's the girl children that are being used and this, is, this practice is really um, destroying our girl children, especially in the rural you areas. You mentioned a financial aspect. Uh, is that a, fi a, a financial aspect of victimization that we see? Yes. Uh, what we need to remember is that when we talk about abuse, it is not just the physical abuse or the verbal abuse. Uh, your partner can also financially control you because like Lida uh, said, that is all about power. So if the abuser can use any means to uh, exert their power over you, that is also through financial means. That could mean that you have no hmm. say in terms of the expenses of the house. If you are someone who owns a salary, it is your husband, for instance, who then tells you what to do with hmm. your salary. Or if you're someone who is unemployed, you have to depend on your husband and he prefers it that way. Now, you talk about the financial aspect. For me, how do you help women then become a little bit more independent? Uh, at the end of it all, it, it's, it's a question of independence, isn't it? Yes, it is. At NISA, Institute for Women's Development, we have counselling and sheltering services. So you find that if a woman is in an abusive relationship, we have a shelter where we can house the ladies for about three months. And from there, while she's in our shelter, we try our best to uh, empower her, uh, to work on her strengths, and also try to see where she can, she can fit in the economy. Uh, we have a skills program called Basadi Pili, where we train ladies who were unemployed or do not mm. have skills or do not have education uh, to make jewellery. Now, I also see that you've compiled a book. It's called Rising Up and Moving On, Moving On Women Writing Our Lives. Tell us about this book. Okay, so this is an incredible book that we published in 2013. Uh, it's basically 11, sto uh, 11 stories of women who are in our shelter or who experience counseling services from us. And they basically tell their stories of abuse, how they met their husbands, mm. how they survived the abuse, and all, also all of the cultural and traditional connotations because these are women from all walks of life in South Africa mm -hmm. and these are from all different types of classes because people assume that it is the rural woman who, who is unemployed mm. that only experiences abuse. What would your advice then be now to uh, women who find them either an abusive relationship or being abused or in peril in general or even financially suppressed. What's your advice? My advice is those ladies is to reach out to someone who can understand and who will um, uh, support you. There are many organizations in your areas. Uh, in South Africa, mm -hmm. if you were to dial 0800 150 150, you'll be connected to a gender-based violence organization in your area. We we are located in Lanesia, Orange Farm, and Soweto, and we are available to all ladies of Hauteng. Finally, Women's Month is coming to an end now. We've, uh, we've, our question of the day uh, deals with that. What do you think of Women's Month, and what do you think of Women's Day and these kinds of practices? Uh, is this enough? Is this lip service, maybe? Well, I think I'd like to appreciate that we do have a Women's Month and we do have a Women's Day in South Africa. And it mustn't just be a ceremonial 
it mustn't just be a ceremonial uh, celebration of women, but rather something that we must be doing every day. We need to respect and appreciate each other um, 365 days of the year. Well, I thank you for joining us uh, this morning. Public Awareness Coordinator at the NISA Institute for Women's Development, Nyasha Mukwani. Thank you very much. Thank you. You should have temptation and pressure to blend. If you do, just try to find yourself again. Omina tells the story of Omina Chinwike, a young African woman whose life suddenly changes after being banned out of a community for getting pregnant out of wedlock. She's carrying twins. That comes with an evil belief in her community. The tyrant king, Izegwe, feels that her unborn twins are a threat to his rule in the kingdom and plans to have her killed. Chinwike's determination to save her unborn children takes us on a spirited journey with a powerful twist in the end. Now joining us in studio today is the director and actress of this sh short film, Vera Ephraim. Very good morning to you, Vera. Good morning, Ephraim. Thank you for having me. Very, very powerful story that is. Tell us, tell us what inspired you to, to tell this story. It's a, it's a very prevalent uh, scenario that plays out not just in our country, the rest of the continent, uh, during or towards the end of what is now Women's Month. Yes, it's actually quite a good thing to out that it came out at this month. It wasn't actually planned, but um, I was inspired by a lot of things to do this story. Um, first, it was just my struggle at that time when I was preparing the script, and also um, the fact that um, some traditions have been uh, made in a way to oppress women, and not traditions I believe that traditions should serve us, not us serving traditions. So, and also my grandmother um, went through that, actually, because that... Um, Really, really, reality um, is a story in the old centuries from my tribe in Igbo land where they had to kill twins and they had to take them into the jungle and have the, the woman have the baby there and then let the children die there because they believed that they just couldn't comprehend why a woman should have two babies at once. So I got inspired and it stayed with me, this story, for ages. And then the right time came and then... I decided to put everything up together and, and make a story, a short film out of it. It, it sounds like a, you talk about your grandmother, a very personal story. Yes. Tell us a little bit more about this belief. Uh, I think for the viewers it might be quite interesting to... Well, what are the fears that communities have with regards to twins? Well, this doesn't happen anymore, but in those times when it was happening, mm -hmm. um, it was a case of um, taking the, the pregnant woman into the jungle mm -hmm. and have the woman have the baby there and leave the twins there to die. So, um, but during the missionaries in Igbo land in Nigeria, mm. the um, Mary Slessor came and a lot of things changed. Yeah. And this is what I mean by, you know, 
that tradition should be as dynamic as human mind, you know? We see that this, this is not working for us, so yeah. let's begin to... Yeah, absolutely. Adjust and, yeah. It's like everything in this universe. Change is the only constant. We have, to, we have to develop. We have to move on. I want to ask you about your own experience, your role, director, actress. Uh, did it all in this movie, didn't you? Well, I did, I, not just me, honestly, because uh, um, it was no-budget film, so I did have a lot of help. I had help from the NGO that I was working with, uh, Lisa de Labatu Mabupani. They mm -hmm. helped me with the manpower. I had friends, I had uh, people raise money for me. And then, so three, four of us had to do like four or five roles. So, um, uh, but um, directing, I started directing in England, so it was also my debut for TV, for, for drama, to do a film as a director. And as an actress, of course, it was quite interesting for me to play it and direct at the same time. Um, yes. what, what are your hopes? It's a very powerful story. What, what do you hope to achieve uh, with the short film? Well, I, I, it's a prequel to a feature. Um, and then I hope that uh, I will have um, investments in production companies who are interested in the story, who would come forward and, and um, try to produce it or interested in it and have a conversation how we can see this into a feature full film and and to an award-winning film, actually, because I do believe in the story. And, and, and what kind of other, other projects are you involved with uh, right now? Well, I'm also a dancer, actress, uh, choreographer, so I do a lot of um, um, outreach program uh, called Giving Back to, to NG, with NGOs to uh, less privileged children. I, I give back uh, through a medium of dance, I encourage them, and, and, and I do a lot of um, work. I have a Western African dance class that I teach in Melville and in Pretoria as well in Hatfield. So all of this ground um, work keep me busy while I do the big work. Well, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you for joining us, uh, director so much. and actress of the short film. Vera Ephraim joined us this morning. The movie is called Umina. It tells the story of Umina Chinwiki, who's a young African woman uh, whose life suddenly changes after being banned out of a community for having, uh, having, for getting pregnant out of wedlock. She had twins. It's a, it's a really powerful story. Anyhow, we move on. The economic freedom fighters have defended their actions at the Trani University of Technology yesterday. This after several students were injured in a clash between uh, the EFF and SASCO supporters on the university's Pretoria West campus yesterday. Here are some of your tweets, uh, or some of the tweets on social media that we've seen. Kessie Tealwe says, uh, hashtag TAT, here we go, politicizing our education system, making our higher institutions hard decisions on issues they never meant to resolve. Frank Nguanyane says, as I'm heading to campus, TUT don't know how my day will be like considering the political violence in campus. Happy Squid says, seriously, thank you so much. I do not think I can leave this community in any future. TUT is now part of me, says Happy Squid. Narisha Govender says, EFF leaders, I use the word loosely, must leave students to their devices and not incite violence. That's a very sober thought there from Narisha. Our institutions, institutions of learning uh, should be exactly that. Now, time for us to take a look at our picture of the day. This one comes from TCS South African. It's captioned, uh, A.B. de Villiers stars as South Africa win uh, the one-day series cider. Of course, that game was played in Durban last night, and the Proteas won by 62 runs to claim the series. Now let's take a look at the front pages from around the globe. Many of the newspapers uh, led with a deadly shooting, of course, of a U.S. reporter and a cameraman in a live television interview. We start in Europe. The Times reports that America was left feeling or reeling yesterday from a watershed moment in its history of gun rampages. The first murder staged for live TV by a killer who then posted footage of the crime on the Internet. In the United Kingdom, the Metro also reports that a TV presenter and a cameraman were shot dead on air yesterday by a vengeful ex-colleague who posted the graphic footage of their murders online. Then in China, the South China Morning Post says 11 senior officials in Tianjin have been detained by prosecutors after the huge explosions in the Chinese port earlier this month that killed at least 139 people. 
Let's take a look at what's happening in our courts today. We start in the Pretoria High Court where the Independent Police Investigative Director of HEAD, Robert McBride, is expected to start his constitutional challenge regarding Police Minister Nadine Klerko's powers to suspend him. McBride does not think Nklerko is allowed to suspend him without consulting other members of Cabinet in terms of the Constitution. Then in Polokwane, two suspects are expected to appear in the Messina court after they were found smuggling 14 and a half kilograms of the drug ephedrine that's worth around 5 million rand smuggling it into South Africa through the Fife Bridge border post uh, a little bit earlier this week. Now, South Africans so still taking to social media sites this morning to congratulate sprint sensation Wade van Nikkeg on his new national and African record. Van Nikkeg won the country its first medal, a gold one, mind you, at the 2015 IWF World Championships in Beijing last night. He won gold after blowing the field away in the 400-meter final to set the brand-new record. Let's take a look at the one lap. Ronnie James got a Santos at the moment. And Van Niekerk running well. Van Niekerk is running well. James coming out hard on the outside. The Sean Merritt losing ground. But it's going to be Van Niekerk. South Africa win it. The behind at the time, 43-47. Well, Merritt just behind there. And Karani James, well, in the end, has to settle, I think, for third. An absolutely phenomenal performance from Wade Van Niekerk. Great 43-65. Karani James, the bronze, 43-78. All three medalists... For more than 10 years, we at CEDA have been giving non-financial support to and developing SMMEs as well as cooperatives, helping them to create jobs. CEDA, together advancing small enterprise development. Hello, it's a favorite minister here. Yane, party is a very nice language because it was written by you, the people. Here's a good one. Try hard, and the individual who prize against all odds. Why? Give me water! Lead the way with a bottle of Scottish Leader for $119.99 and help make party South Africa's 12th official language. Tops at Spa. Shake things up. Welcome back. You're watching Newsroom on SABC News. Let's take a look at the stories making headlines today. President Jacob Zuma and Chief Justice Mkhweng Mkhweng are set to meet at the union buildings this morning. The meeting was requested by the judiciary last month to discuss the relationship between government and the courts. Two policemen from the Douglasdale police station in Johannesburg have been placed on leave pending an investigation into police brutality. Earlier, the station spokesperson did, however, say that the officers had been suspended, but provincial police say the officers are on leave pending that investigation. This follows a YouTube video which has gone viral showing the officers allegedly assaulting two motorists. And the South African National Taxi Association has strongly condemned the recent incidents associated, associated to taxi violence in Gauteng. In the latest incident, one person was shot dead and two taxi drivers critically wounded. This happened during a suspected taxi feud at the Noor Taxi Ramp in Johannesburg last night. 
Well, remember, you can find all of those stories on our newsroom Facebook page. Simply search for SABC Newsroom. Of course, you can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Eben, over to you. Thank you very much, Anina. It seems like a story uh, film script writers would dream about. A young Cape Town girl reunited with a biological family, uh, well, at 17, after having been recognised by her own sister, a pupil at the same school that she attended. South Africans saw the story of Zephni Nurse being found and returned to her biological mo mother unfold this year. Now, you can read all about this in a brand new book, and we're joined uh, from Cape Town Live by the author of A Home for Zephni. He's also the media, media manager at the University of Stellenbosch's business school, Heinrich Feinhardt. Very good morning to you, Heinrich. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, Evan, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Heinrich, this is a cracking, cracking book, and it must have been quite difficult for you to put it together because the family refused to do any interviews initially with, with local media. How, how did you go about telling Zephni's story with, without interviewing her parents in this, in this instance? Well, even because the family has made it clear that they were not going to do any interviews and because Zephni um, is not allowed to be identified, or her true mm. identity, rather, um, and also because the woman who's accused of stealing her is not allowed to speak to the media or wouldn't speak to the media. Mm. I had no intention, really, to interview anyone um, who were that closely involved with the story. My interest was really triggered by the fact that I am a, I don't know if I should call myself a former journalist, um, <laughs> but I'm no longer in the newsroom, so I looked at it from uh, the distance now of being at a business school, more as a media commentator, if you like. Mm. Um, so what triggered me, obviously, was the gripping detail of the story, and then secondly, my interest in how the media covers stories. Um, so I tried to combine my journalistic skills with mm. my role as a social commentator and then retell the story from what I've read, from what I've heard and mm -hmm. seen, which means I took every archived article about the story, I tried to gather all the current or recent news articles in newspapers, mm -hmm. I transcribed all the radio interviews that I could lay my hand on, I also transcribed all the television interviews that I could lay my hand on, and what I did was to, to not just tell the story as it was told by the biological parents, but, mm. but also to comment. So in this book, you don't just see a repeat of what has been reported. It's more an analytical or commentary take on the story so that I offer the reader something extra. Now, now Heinrich, just show us the cover of the book here. I see you've got it in your hand. But also tell us this very interesting story. Uh, just, just, just sort of your take on it in 30 seconds plus, of course, your, your experience. It is a human story that transcends every, every border, every whatever class or race or that you can think of. It's, it's just simply a gripping human story. A mother gives birth and two, three days later, mm -hmm. someone takes her baby away from a, a very young mother, I should add. And this girl is not seen until 17, 18 years later when she is, um, well, when children at the school where another of her, child, of her daughters now attends tells them that there's another girl at the school looking just like you. Um, and so, so it's really the stuff, as you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, that movies are made of. No, no, I, I understand that you believe it would be in the girl's best interests, in the teenager's best interest now, if people knew who she was. Why, why do you think that? There, there is a court order uh, even that prevents the media from identifying the girl. Um, I believe that if you allow her or encourage her to come forward and say, this is who I am, please take your photographs and then allow me to focus on my matric mm. final exams that's coming up, she wouldn't feel like, I mean, I, I can only imagine that um, when you find yourself in this situation and there's a court order now that says no one is supposed to know your true identity, effectively you are, in a legal way, if I may use this expression, mm. still kidnapped. Yes. And I'm saying if you allow her to say this is who I am, um, I'd like to focus on my matric exams now and then encourage her to become a youth ambassador 
for all those other kids on the Cape Flats and all over the country, all over the world for that matter, mm. who needs positive role models. The girl known as Zephni can very easily become that. Now, Heinrich, the story of life in general is written in beautiful irony. I always see irony as the story of the human experience. Now, there's real irony in the name Zephni and what it means, isn't there? Yeah, the name um, is derived from um, Zephra, that means the Lord gave. Mm -hmm. And the irony here is that three days after the Lord gave, this young mother, Celeste Nurse, this beautiful girl, she was taken away from her. But the story continues. Remember, there's now this issue of where the girl should be staying. She's chosen to continue living with the man who raised her. Yeah. On the other hand, you have a, and I'm using this word very cautiously, um, a dysfunctional situation where her biological parents are divorced and living mm. apart. In yeah. fact, her biological mother just got engaged again. Um, so I can imagine that it must be really tough for her, yeah. and maybe the most difficult part is deciding where she should stay. Luckily, yeah. she's 18 years old now and can make the decision for herself. Now, Heinrich, before you go, where can, we, where can we buy this book? All good bookstores, I would think. Well, first, the book is online, available <laughs> at naledibooks.com, and you can also get it from takealot.co.za, but it should be out in the bookstores from this week. Um, yeah. And I'd just like to add this, even if you would allow me. The story is not my story. I've been accused of stealing yeah. a girl's story. I've been accused by a bi biological father that I'm writing about their pain. The fact is, it's out in the open. I'm trying to tell the story yeah. in a very sympathetic way. And on top of it, the information is in here is no secret. Yeah. Um, the parents chose to do interviews for which they apparently got paid. I think they have the right to do that. But they must also allow writers, and that's my role, to tell stories like this from a community that I come from. Maybe you should have paid for the interview, Heinrich. You know, that's how the world works I don't now. have money. <laughs> I'm hoping that the book will sell so that I can cover the production cost at least. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Heinrich Weinhardt, who wrote this book, so. A Home for Zephni. It's a cracking South African story. It's, it's, it's a story about, a, about a, the kidnapping of a baby out of a hospital after, after she's two years old, being reunited with a family at the age of... 17. The irony of it all, she went to the same school as her sister and they looked absolutely alike. Can you believe that? Now, two employees of the WDBJ news station, reporter Alison Parker and cameraman Adam Ward, were shot and killed in the midst of a live broadcast yesterday. It's caused quite a sensation all over the internet. Almost broke the internet, they tell me. Here are some of the tweets that have been doing the rounds on this. Maddie Orn says, Dear Virginia, there's not much I can do but say I'm truly sorry for your loss. May everything please be okay. That's a sentiment shared from Maddie there. Kamal says, Video of Virginia shooting is enough to show why gun control can't happen soon enough. Censorship will only sweep this under the NRA's rug. Dandre says, Tired of everyone always focusing solely on victims. Virginia shooting, the perpetrators were people too. Three precious souls lost today. Sad that a nation is so willing to trade its innocence for its freedom. Hashtag Virginia shooting. Of course, a former anchor is the guy who did the shooting. So the guy who committed suicide and did the Virginian, Virginia shooting was bullied to the point of depression. Makes sense. Yes, all the details will start to come out. It's a cracking story. It's a story that relates to what we do yeah at SABC News imagine an anchor getting fired coming back and shooting an entire cast it it's almost it's almost unthinkable in what we do anyhow last night a brand new South African film premiered in Rosebank yeah in Johannesburg a South African production from Rififi Pictures called tell me sweet something it's a romantic comedy shot uh, in the city directed by Aking Omotoso he also directed the 2011 xenophobia film man on ground the film will be released on September the 18th. Now, Nadia Adams was at this premiere. Last night saw the premiere of the much-anticipated film Tell Me Sweet Something at the State Kinikor in Rosebank, Johannesburg. Cast and crew were all in attendance for the red carpet event. From director Akin Omotoso comes this love story set in the city of gold. The film stars Isibaya's Nomzama Mbata, 
model Maps Mapunyani, and SAFTA winner Tishiwe Zikubu. Omotoso is known for his 2011 film about xenophobia, Man on Ground. This time, he decided to show a different side. I've always loved Love Jones, the movie. I love love songs. And I, I, and I think, and I'm a, you know, I'm a romantic at heart, so this story has been in my, in my brain for a while, even while I was doing Man on Ground and those kind of, you know, I always wanted to tell a love story. Tell Me Sweet Something tells the story of Moratiwa, played by Mbata, an aspiring novelist with writer's block and fear of commitment. She hasn't had much luck with love ever since her ex-boyfriend went out to buy milk and never came back. Mbata believes more support needs to be given to local films. Local films aren't given a long time in the box office. In fact, they're given just a week. But depending on their opening weekend, so in the opening weekend if they make a lot of money, then obviously the cinema houses will look at that and they think, OK, this, this film is making a lot of money, so maybe it can stay for a month. Maponyani is the lead male in this film. He plays Nat Masilo, or better known as a 45-foot man. I can't even believe I'm, I'm on the big screen. It's my first film, first premiere. Uh, there's been so much press leading up to tonight. But um, yeah, I think, I think we did a good job. I think we, we have made the people a good movie. The Rififi Pictures film is funded by Invest Media and also backed by the National Film and Video Foundation the Gauteng Film Commission and the Department of Trade and Industry. Nadia Adams, SABC News, Johannesburg. Well, let's take a look now at what you can see on Newsroom's Facebook page today. One person's been shot dead, of course, and two others, taxi drivers, critically wounded in a suspected taxi feud at the Nuot taxi rank here in Johannesburg. Then President Jacob Zuma will attempt to discuss the relationship between government and the judiciary at a meeting at the union buildings this morning. And in Lesotho, the bus Lesotho are eagerly waiting to hear what exiled former opposition leader and Prime Minister Tom Tabani will say when he addresses the media a little bit later today. For all the updates, you can just put SABC Newsroom in the search bar. Please like our page. Please like our page. And you'll get in your stream all the latest updates. Time for us to take a break. When we come back, we do the Innovation Summit from Cape Town. Your World makes it its business every evening to round up the leading local stories and international news to keep you informed all the time. Make a date with Your World every evening for all the news headlines around the world to keep you abreast with knowledge. Catch Your World for headlines across the world every Monday to Friday from 9pm, then Saturday and Sunday from 7pm. Innovation intelligence, that is the theme for this year's Innovation Summit that's currently underway at the Cape Town Stadium. The summit is hosting South African, African and global innovators who've come together to showcase their exceptional talents and ideas. Along with this, the 2015 theme will look at how new and convergent thinking helps to create com a competitive edge in today's saturated marketplace. At the summit this morning is our very own reporter in Cape Town, Nomaweto Solwande, with uh, a few guests. But before you do the talking, just set the scene quickly for us, Nomaweto. Well, a very good morning to you, Eben. Indeed, we are coming to you live from the Cape Town Stadium, where the 2015 SA Innovation Summit is currently underway. And like you've said, this summit brings together the very best South African, African and global innovators, researchers, and it gives them a chance to share ideas. Like you've said, the theme for this year is innovation intelligence. There'll be a lot of plenary um, debates or discussions. There'll 
there'll be a lot of intensive workshops and not only are they going to share ideas but they'll also get a chance to discuss the key challenges in the industry we all know that there are a lot of people with great ideas but some of them don't quite make it that far and this is a chance for stakeholders in the industry to discuss how young um, minds with great ideas young entrepreneurs can make it far in the industry and to tell us more about the core function and what they hope to get out of the summit we are now joined by Rashmi Ralgavan who is the director of strategic partnerships and customer care at the DTI thank you so much for joining us uh, good morning and thank you for also having us um, on this program to share this with the audience uh, as well. I think for us as the Department of Trade and Industry, we saw this as a strategic platform to also be involved and engaged in the discussions, especially when you look at what is happening globally as well as locally. And in order for the economy and in order for entrepreneurs to be competitive, this is certainly a stage that brings all the collaborative partners together to be able to look and discuss the different trends, uh, the different developments, how do we stay competitive, and this gave us and, and gives us the platform to engage with and to be able to identify, shape, and develop programs that are responsive to the industry itself. Now, Rashmi, I looked at the theme innovation intelligence I didn't get it what is this supposed to mean okay when you look at innovation really what is it all about um, and when you look at in intelligence it's really about gathering of information how do you become and how do you stay competitive and relevant in a local environment as well as a global environment especially as we continue to have these disruptive technologies happening how do you stay aligned with the trends that are happening globally how do you align it to your local environment environments and how do you stay um, relevant to be able to use that information, use that um, uh, data in order to develop and design programs that are going to keep you more efficient, um, have a much more inclusive growth within the economy and be competitive when you're competing against the world as well. Now, we also got some very bad news with regards to our economy, South African economy, this week. Talk to us about all these great minds that are gathered here, and then what? How does innovation help us increase our GDP? Yes. I think when you look at innovation, you are looking at new product, new processes, um, and especially in a world in which we live in where things are just happening so quick and so fast itself, how do you continue to stay relevant? And that requires you to now take technology and innovation to a different level because in order to be competitive, in order to be able to design and develop products that are not just for your own country's consumption, but for the global consumption itself, it requires you to think ahead and to create an industry and create the minds that are able to come up with products and processes that allow us to continue to export, that continue to for us to be leading as a country within Africa, as a country even within the world, to come up with products and processes that give you that leading edge. And through the shaping and the designing and the developing of programs together with other minds and to create a value chain that allows us to be at the lead and to be at the forefront of this allows us also to become more competitive going forward. So even though uh, you know we've had challenges, especially with manufacturing itself, you know things change over time, and this is certainly a passing time in which to now review and relook at how are we doing things and to be in line with coming up with new things. Now, Rashmi, very briefly, I know that um, Minister Rob Davies will also be launching some sort of program um, here later. Just tell us more about uh, that, that program. Okay. I think, you know, the department has certainly realized the importance of technology and innovation and the role that it plays in the economy itself. And certainly when you look at um, entrepreneurs and what they have to do in terms of research and development, in terms of coming up with new products and, and, and processes, there is a need for support. And we've certainly, as the department, are looking to address this in terms of how do we support our entrepreneurs, both, you know, um, uh, techno-savvy entrepreneurs, um, 
uh, potential ones that are coming up in the economy, those that are existing and want to take the next wave. And certainly this particular program is going to help them develop that. It's going to support them. And as we collaborate with our partners, both in government, academic, as well as with the entrepreneurs, we are able to create a value chain that takes us to the next level in terms of technology itself. Thank you very much for your time. Well, that was Rashmi Ralgavan, the Director for Strategic Partnerships and Customer Care from the DTI. Well, I was hoping that I'd speak to one of the innovators that are here to showcase their talent at this summit, but unfortunately, we've run out of time. It's back to you in the studio, Eben. Thank you, Nomoweto. Of course, uh, the summit will be ongoing for the rest of the week until the 29th. It's at the Cape Town Stadium. Uh, it's a fantastic event. It showcases what we do in South Africa, but also what we are doing on the continent. How are we innovating and how innovation is changing the game for all of us here on the continent. There, there's some fantastic, some fantastic innovative ideas that I've seen. Some of them were, were, were toilets that don't use water and so forth. Real, real interesting uh, ideas that really can be game changers for all of us here on the continent. That's where we leave it this morning. Newsroom, of course, broadcast live from our studios here in Auckland Park, Johannesburg, every weekday morning between 9 and 10 a.m. Don't forget, we also stream live on YouTube at that time, but the whole show is always available on demand on our YouTube channel. This is SABC News. You've been watching Newsroom, where we love it every morning.